Okay, everyone. So moving on in now 13b, we're going to be talking about sexual dysfunction. And we're just going to start with some introductory comments. And then the other sections of the lecture, we'll get into some of the specific disorders. So these are all the things that we're going to talk about um, so that you can kind of see them according to their Kaplan's phase of the sexual response cycle. Um, so we're going to talk about disorders of the desire phase, the vasocongestive phase or arousal, uh, pain disorders, which are kind of their own subset, and then disorders of orgasm or the orgasmic release phase. The first thing that I want to talk about is the fact that sexual dysfunction or trouble with sexuality and sexual function is common. So um, you can see up top experience pain during sex. So, you know, almost, you know, more than 15% of female bodied people or woman identified people report pain and even some male bodied folks. Uh, the next one is sex not being pleasurable, right? That's part of the point. So, um, and, and I just want to point out that again, we tend to have the societal assumption that men are always crazy for sex and they always love sex. Um, but that's not reflecting the truth. That's not actually reflecting reality. Um, difficulty achieving orgasm, pretty common in female bodied people, but also almost 10% of male bodied people. That's an orgasmic disorder. In terms of desire disorder, lack of interest in sex, really common in female-bodied people, about 33%, but also not uncommon in male-bodied people at more than 15%. Anxiety about performance, and we'll talk about that. Climaxing too early, so uh, premature ejaculation or early orgasm, more common in male-bodied people, and we'll talk about that in detail when we get to that. Or then trouble with the arousal or vasocongestive phase. We've got difficulty maintaining an erection or erectile dysfunction, as well as on the female-bodied person, the kind of corollary to that would be difficulty with lubrication. So what I want to point out, first of all, is like, what do we classify as a disorder anyway, right? So I love this t-shirt. I'm perfectly abnormal, right? So somebody may have a sexual behavior or a sexual response cycle or something about their physiology or their body that isn't typical or that isn't common, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's abnormal, right? It's not necessarily a disorder. So we only classify something as a disorder if it's bothering the person, right? If it's not causing them any problems, if they're like, no, my life is good, everything's fine, this doesn't bother me, then it's not a disorder. OK, when it comes to sexual function, um, it's only if it's bothering them that it's a disorder. OK, so um, this is that information again for your notes. And so it's got to be bothering them or causing negative consequences in their relationships in order for us to classify it as a disorder, because we have to keep in mind that a lot of what we think is normal is culturally constructed. And we'll get into that a bit today. So expectations. So one of the media assignments is to watch a video clip from College Humor about, you know, people's expectations of what sex was going to be like and the things that they didn't know um, and kind of all the hijinks that they get into because of that. So performance anxiety affects everybody, right? And so we have this idea that men are going to be able to get erect and stay erect for a very long time until their partner orgasms at least once. Um, which may not be realistic, right? And we also have this expectation that female-bodied people are going to always be ready and willing for sex and, and lubricated and wet, and they're, and they're going to be able to orgasm through intercourse alone. And so we have all these expectations, and everybody's like, oh, well, I want to be, I want to be good at sex. I want to be a good partner. And so sometimes we're so worried about whether we're living up to those expectations, right, that it generates something called spectatoring. So spectatoring is like there's this piece of your brain that's kind of like watching and being like, ooh, like, did I just make a weird noise? Like, oh, did that, is, you know, is what I just did, is that okay? You know, so you're kind of like, 
you know, like the sports broadcaster on the sidelines, you know, oh no, she touched his butt, is he going to flinch, you know, or whatever it might be. So this um, kind of watching and judging yourself instead of just being in the moment and enjoying what's happening and focusing on communicating with your partner um, can really interfere with your ability to enjoy the situation and for things to go well. We also have all of these societal messages about what's physically attractive and what's sexy. And um, they're often very far out of line with what most people's bodies look like. And so it can be really important as if you're gonna share your body with someone to learn to love your body and appreciate all of the amazing things about your body. Our bodies are incredible. They are amazing and they are fabulous in all of their shapes and forms, right? So I'm gonna tell you, there is far more right with your body than there is wrong with it, trust me, right? So, but we have to be able to feel attractive. We have to be able to own that. So that's important. And then there are these expectations about what to do, which have changed a lot. So your generation is very different from mine, for sure, where, you know, the most porn I was ever exposed to is like my grandpa's Playboy magazines hidden under the bed or, um, you know, I think somebody had a VHS tape of the porn film Come Deeply when I was in college that we watched, right? Um, but you have more access to pornography than any other generation has ever had because so much is online. And that's really, we, what we found is that's really changed people's ideas of what they're supposed to be doing. And, um, and a lot of that is really unrealistic. So what I tell people is like porn stars, like, those are professionals. They're almost like professional athletes. So I kind of liken it to, you know, imagine you're gonna go ice skating at the rink here in town, but all you've ever seen is video of the Olympic figure skaters, right? And so then when you get out there and you can't do a triple axel, right? You're gonna be like, oh, I'm terrible at this. I can't, I'm no good at sex. No, right? That's just, that's like, that's just not for amateurs, right? That's just not, real life ice skating, a lot of what you see in pornography. And some of the things that are in porn are actually truly unhealthy and damaging, right? There are a lot of um, psychologically damaging uh, things that happen, especially some of the hardcore porn. It's demeaning, it's debasing, it's abusive. Um, and so you have to be really careful about um, how your expectations are being framed and what types of messages you're exposing your brain to. Because human brains learn by what the people around them are doing and it will change your expectations. Even if you think you know that that's just porn, it will change your brain. Um, and so what that ends up with is that sometimes people are trying to do things that they don't really want to do or they don't feel comfortable doing or they're not ready for, you know, some of these sexual behaviors are really kind of advanced and not for the novice, right? So even anal sex is not for a novice, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of considerations that have to go into that. So um, expectations about what to do are also important. 